human being so sinful that God's sovereign grace must create and decisively fulfill every human inclination to believe and obey God. Luther's answer was, yes, it is that sinful. There is that much bondage. And from my understanding of the text that I've given you, he's right about that, which means Pelagianism was wrong. Fallen man cannot create his own holy choices. And it means semi-Pelagianism was wrong. Which means in the act of faith and the pursuit of holiness, man does not complete God's prevenient grace by contributing his own decisive self-determining power. Say that again. Pre Semi-Pelagianism, different from Pelagianism, doesn't say man is capable on his own of producing holy choices. That's Pelagianism. Semi-Pelagianism says, no, 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 no. We are more sinful than that. God, by his grace, prevenient coming before grace, jump starts your spiritual life. And you provide the decisive, self-determining contribution to fulfill the act of faith and obedience and Luther and I, and I think the Bible, you judge, says that's not true. That's a distortion of what the Bible says. I'll give you three passages about this issue of why, why do you keep saying, Piper, create and decisively fulfill? What, 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 what is that? I kind of get create. Like, I'm dead. There's got to be a creation. I, I get that. What are you talking about with every inclination to obedience? God must decisively fulfill. But what, where are you getting that? What is that? I'll give you three passages that are making me think that way. One is Paul praying in 2 Thessalonians 1.11. He prays like this. May God fulfill. That's why I chose that word. Play ra'o. May God fulfill every resolve for good. And work of faith by his power. His power. May God fulfill every good resolve. You got any good resolves? Praise God. Guess what? They're not going to happen. Unless sovereign grace finishes them. That's the way Paul prayed for the saints. That's the way I pray for my soul and my family. Second text. How did he think about Christian Work and obedience and labor and effort and striving and mortification. Answer, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I. This is Paul the saint, well into his life. It was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul's working was not added to God's working. It was produced by God's working, he says. So much so that he would say, it is not I. I'm working like crazy. I prepared this message. And it was not I. That's a a believer way into their Christian life talking about their utter dependence 
every hour of every day on grace to fulfill the good resolve to preach a sermon that has any spiritual worth to it at all. One more text on this. He not only said that about himself, he said it about every one of you, and he called every one of you to live this way in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. You know this. Work out your salvation. Kater Godzamai, produce, make it happen. Make your rescue from sin happen. Oh, for Bible people. Oh, for Bible people. Oh, for Bible people. Not, I'm tempted to say gospel people. But all of the Bible loved, believed, beat your head against it until it yields all of it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is the one who's at work in you, willing and working his good pleasure. Our working is not added to God's working. Our working is God's working. Here's the way Edwards put it. He's really unusually effective in these sentences. I mean, I'm to totally biased toward Jonathan Edwards that he's effective almost everywhere I look. But here's what he says about, we are not merely passive in it, it meaning act of faith and obedience. We're not merely passive in it, nor yet does God do some and we do the rest. For God does all and we do all. And then he explains what that means. God produces all, we act all. For that is what he produces, our acts. God is the only proper author and fountain. We only are proper actors. We are in different respects, wholly passive and wholly active. End of quote. If, if you no longer are in bondage to guilt and, and death and blindness, if you now love the light, love the light, not hate the light, if you delight in the exaltation of God's glory more than your own glory, if you love his authority, love his authority more than your autonomy, if you see and savor the glory of Christ in the gospel as your greatest treasure, you owe it all to grace, sovereign, omnipotent, triumphant grace. You don't just owe it to grace because God jump-started your dead will and waited to see what you would make of it with your self-determining contribution. But you owe it all to grace because from that day when he jump-started it with the creation of your living soul, from that day, the grace of God will be the decisive fulfiller, producer of every holy act you ever perform to eternity. Brothers, I speak to the pastors. It is, and I'm, I've just got one more paragraph. It is, I think, a colossal mistake to preach only the believer's new freedom and new identity in Christ, desperately hoping they will love it. It's hopeless. Unless you preach the old bondage and the old identity in Adam, without that knowledge, how will they ever know the meaning of grace? How will they ever see, feel, savor a degree of gratitude and thankfulness?
for grace that they ought to feel. How will they ever live to the praise of the glory of God's grace? And I was saying to CJ in the car on the way over, he, he can remember the resurrection in his life. He, he, he was pulled out of absolute unbelief that he can remember. John Piper never remembers being an unbeliever. I don't know which of us needs this teaching more. I just know I need it desperately because the only way John Piper can know my true condition experientially is two things. One, to watch my sin happen. The old man that, we, that hangs on the cross put to death what is earthly in you is constantly trying to pull his hands off the nails. And you're supposed to nail him back every day. Put to death what is earthly in you. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So John Piper is so aware of the nature of this old man. And the way I talk to my wife, the way I talk to my kids, the way I feel discouraged, the way I feel oppressed, the way I want your approval. All oh, this bad word come out of your mouth now. And then you add to, to that mirror observation the biblical interpretation of what that is. Without this teaching, I would not know what horrible, horrible person died when I was six years old. So whether you're, you're a convert who can remember with trembling what he plucked you from, or a, or a little kid who grew up in a Christian home and never remembers being an unbeliever. This is important. This is so important. If John Piper's gonna know grace, love grace, sing grace, live grace, I need to be taught these things and I think your people do too. God's grace will not be glorified as it ought to be until the church with a deep understanding and with exploding joy says from the heart, from him and through him and to him are all things, including my faith and every act of obedience to him be glory forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, I so long to taste more deeply, drink more deeply, and I know I speak for thousands. We long to drink more deeply at the fountain of sovereign grace. The only way we can begin to know it, taste it, savor it, live by it, die for it, is to have the Bible explode with fresh light for our hearts. We're not going to know this any way than to have an assessment from you of our condition. And so I pray that this extended exposure to the devastating condition we are in would release fresh love, fresh thankfulness, fresh devotion, fresh mission, fresh patience in the long obedience in the same direction in the pastoral ministry. Come. Do your sanctifying, saving, mission-advancing work, I pray.